Harvard Divinity School. Explorations in Interdisciplinary Psychedelic Research, Regulation Panel, April 1st, 2023. All right, so our first speaker for, from the panel will be um, Glenn Cohen, who is the faculty director of the Petrie Flom Center, the James A. Atwood and Leslie Williams Professor of Law, and Deputy Dean at Harvard Law School. He is one of the world's leading experts on the intersection of bioethics, sometimes also called medical ethics, and the law, as well as health law. He also teaches civil procedure here. Thank you so much. Great, it's okay to do it from here because I don't have any slides. I'm just gonna keep sitting, which is good, you know. Always fun to relax, lean into it. So when I say words like artistic inspiration, a salve for a mental health crisis, when I say words like spiritual enlightenment, I know there's only one word people in the room think of, and that is lawyer, of course, right? <laughs> So you might wonder what it is the law has to contribute to this great discourse we're having today. And I'm gonna to try to convince you the answer is quite a lot. So I am the faculty director of Poplar, the project on psychedelic law and regulation. Other people affiliated would include Mason, Carmel Shachar, Jeannie Sue Gerson, Leonard's also an affiliate, Logan's been working for us. And we've done a number of papers on the questions of legal regulation, the legal future of psychedelics. I'm gonna talk about two of them, one published, one still in progress, just give a little preview of that one. But if I wanna give you a high level idea of where we're going, my own view is we're at a moment where there are three pathways for psychedelic use in America. And while they are all burgeoning, there's gonna be points where they come into friction with one another. One is a medicalized model which brings it into the therapeutic relationship of psychiatrists of prescription. One is a religious model of spirituality and fellowship. And one, for lack of a better word, word is personal use, right? Some people might use the word recreational, but I think that devalues what we're talking about. Uh, and unfortunately, it is the case that the regulatory superstructure has to think about how these are going to intersect. And some of the decisions we're going to make are going to clamp down on one while they burgeon another. Um, and you know, I find it fascinating. It's an amazing moment to be doing this work. There's visionaries. I'm so honored to be sharing uh, the dais with this man who kind of saw this world a long time ago and built towards it. But we're at a moment where Congress hears jointly from veterans and indigenous populations on these subjects, where they hear about mental health suffering, but also hear from big pharma on the question. So it's a very interesting moment of strange bedfellows in some instances, but also real possibilities. So the first topic I wanna to talk about is intellectual property. And here I'm gonna draw from a paper I wrote with Mason in the Harvard Law Review Forum. So patents, as many of you know, are a form of government-granted monopoly. They give the holders the right to exclude others from making, using, or selling an invention for approximately 20 years from the date each patent application is filed. The public policy justification for such patents is that the right to exclude competitors incentivizes innovation and encourages inventors to disclose their inventions to the public instead of maintaining them as trade secrets. We see companies like the British pharmaceutical firm Compass Pathfinder Limited seeking and obtaining patents to protect the formulations of psychedelic compounds and methods of producing and administering them. Such companies argue that patents are necessary to protect their investment, not only in drug discovery, but also because of the cost of commercialization, which may involve very expensive clinical trials, as you well know, and other requirements to obtain FDA approval, as well as buy-in from the medical community thereafter. This sudden influx of psychedelic patents has prompted criticism from stakeholders, including patients, indigenous populations, journalists, lawyers, and the like. And they contend that the patents can exploit the traditional knowledge of indigenous communities without permission or adequate acknowledgement and compensation. Others argue that psychedelic patents are making a small number of companies gatekeepers for the emerging uh, psychedelic industry, which could inhibit research, stifle innovation, and restrict access to needed therapies. In addition, some commentators frame the medical problem landscape as a thicket a dense web of interlocking patent rights that restrict the entry of competitors. Formed when patent holders pepper the field with numerous patents on the same product or closely related product, these patent thickets discourage researchers and manufacturers from entering the field out of fear of being sued for infringement or having to pay a high licensing fee to patent holders. In many cases, the result will be that only large, well-capitalized firms will be able to navigate these murky regulatory waters surrounding psychedelic research and development. Granting patent exclusivity enhances existing disparities, and the unique characteristics of psychedelics 
together with the regulatory environment surrounding them, may increase the likelihood of issuing bad patents, that are patents granted on inventions that do not meet the patentability requirements or that were patented in bad faith to block competition. And this is a real problem because the people who work at the PTO, the Patent Trademark Office, they typically lack examiners with sufficient knowledge of these substances and their history. There's been long-standing prohibitions, of course, of drug use from very people in the federal government. And the associated stigma and criminalization could threaten one's professional reputation and employment prospects. And when you don't have patent examiners with detailed knowledge of psychedelic compounds and their history of indigenous as well as underground use, the chance of bad patents getting through is more likely. Critics of psychedelic patents argue that many granted and recently filed patents would not stand up to scrutiny. While some of these could lack novelty, which is a requirement of the patent statute, others may lack non-obviousness because a person having ordinary skill in the field could have foreseen how to make them. Others would be invalid if they claim naturally occurring psychedelic plants or fungi or phenomena exhibited by these organisms as patent subject matter. But unfortunately, even if patents might ultimately be invalidated if challenged, they can be used to cause significant offensive harm against challengers. Patent holders can claim infringement by potential competitors, many of whom will be unable to mount an effective defense due to the prohibitively high cost of litigation. To use an evocative phrase of my colleague Bob Nukin in another context, business decisions are often made in the shadow of law such that the threat of such litigation by a patent holder may deter backers from, uh, from, from investing in a space. Asymmetries of power resulting from abuse of the patent system are particularly relevant to this emerging industry where barriers to entry are already very high. And we view the history of ketamine as a bit of a cautionary tale from which a uh, space in which large companies have monopolized the space. We also see a race between those who want to push a psychedelic renaissance focused on naturally occurring substances and those who want to push one based on synthetic psychedelics and the ways in which existing IP law and the cost of the FDA processes sets up some tension and some preferences for one of the other. And one way to think about it is that IP will to some extent set the terms about what psychedelics we get, which are allowed in, outside of underground use, and which are readily available for the therapies we so desperately need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Glenn. Our next speaker is Rick Doblin, PhD. Rick Doblin is the founder and president of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS. He received his doctorate in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where he wrote his dissertation on the regulation of the medical uses of psychedelics and marijuana, and his master's thesis on a survey of oncologists about smoked versus oral THC pills in, in nausea control for ca cancer patients. He also conducted a 34-year follow-up study to Timothy Leary's Concord Prison Experiment. Welcome to the stage, Rick Doblin. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, first off, I just wanted to make um, oops, uh, a comment about terminology. Um, so, Max, I just be careful about uh, counterculture as a term. So I think that was one of the big mistakes of the 60s for people to identify as counterculture. And so the thrust of our work has been to try to become the culture instead of to be the counterculture. Um, and then, Glenn, just you were struggling for another word for recreational. And so I, I like the word celebratory. It, it doesn't have the kind of pejorative terms that, that recreational does. Um, so I'm just going to briefly give you an, an overview. Brevity is, is not my strength, <laughs> but I will try my very best. Um, and it's, of course, um, it's almost Good Friday uh, coming right up. So 61 years of psychedelics at Harvard. Um, what got me into psychedelics was um, 1972, and it was out of despair for the way the uh, world was going, the uh, Vietnam War. I was uh, um, in one of the last years of uh, the lottery, I'd been traumatized at a distance from the stories of the Holocaust and also the Cuban Missile Crisis, we could blow up the whole world. And so when I first started doing psychedelics, I got this sense that if we could identify not as our tribe, as our culture, as our religion, as our gender, as our nationality, any of these things, if we could have a deeper sense of who we, were, who we are, that would be the antidote to uh, racism and genocide. And uh, there's a great album by Rita Marley, uh, Bob Marley's wife. It's Who Feels It Knows It. 
So it's not just to say it, you gotta feel it, and often this is where psychedelics come in. And not that they're the only way, but they're a major way, and they've been used for thousands of years. So this sort of theory of change was reaffirmed for me by Robert Mueller. This was 1983, and he was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. He also started the UN University for Peace in Costa Rica. And this was his idea about shaping a global spirituality. And you can see that the Earth from Space was on the cover of the book, and he was saying that astronauts a lot of times were getting this, the sort of overlook effect. So psychedelics aren't the only way. It's a lot cheaper to give somebody psychedelics, though, than <laughs> shoot them up in space. Uh, but the theory is this, that mysticism is the antidote to fundamentalism. And I think that's going to be one of the major challenges, I think, particularly here at the Divinity School, is how do we take people who are, um, you could say, in some ways, um, inspired by, but also trapped by fundamentalism and literalism? And how do we help them realize that if they let go of that, something deeper is this um, sort of experiential sense. And it doesn't mean that they have to give away your cultural context or your terms, but you can see them in a different way. So this was, um, for me, very inspiring. And so I ended up writing a letter to Robert Mueller. And I said, your book is great. I totally agree with it. But you don't say anything about psychedelics. And would you like to know about psychedelics? Um, and can you help us bring back psychedelic research? And, and he said yes. Um, now, this is, you can't really read it, but I just want to say that uh, I developed a proposal for Robert Mueller in 1984, and this was for something that um, is happening, in a sense, right now by um, the studies of uh, religious leaders with psychedelics at Hopkins and NYU. So this was an idea, is can we take a bunch of people who are in training for different religions and have uh, different groups, and some of them get psychedelics and some of them don't, and then you do a, a sort of cross-analysis from all the people in the different religions because a lot of the imagery is not going to be from, I would predict, is not going to be from their own cultural context. It will be, but it will also be other cultural contexts. And then what kind of um, studies can we see? And is there such a thing as an underlying uh, common mystical core? And we don't think twice about it when we talk about languages, right? Um, there's all these different languages, but we don't say Russian is uh, better than Ameri English and English is better than German. You know, they're all coming from our common desire to communicate using sounds. So I think that that's one way to um, think about religion. And we actually did uh, scout the UN grounds for a potential psychedelic research site at the time because the UN is not technically in America. They've got their own little legal status. So we, we never got permission to do this at the time, though, or didn't do it. But this, I think, is what's really exciting about the work that's going on with psychedelics and spirituality. Um, this is our um, MAPS logo uh, as interpreted by Alex Gray. But the important point is that the hands are in front and the psychedelic swirly images in the back, meaning that it's about therapy, it's not about the drug. The drug makes the therapy more effective. It's not like ketamine that's often administered without any therapy. This is therapy is administered with the adjunct of a psychedelic. And that's the message that we're trying to get across also to the FDA, to the DEA, that this is really a therapy tool. Um, now, this was uh, Timothy Leary and I in uh, 1990. And so this was a benefit for MAPS. And it was tremendous. And after um, his talk, I went up to him and I said, um, can you pre please um, give us some advice? Those of us who are wanting to work with the government to try to do psychedelic research, you know, you've been struggling for so long in this field of psychedelics and you did this early work at Harvard. You know, what advice would you have for those of us who want to do work with the government? So the first thing he said is, fuck the government. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said, I am so far past uh, asking for permission for anything, but I'm glad you're doing it. <laughs> and, and that's where he held up my hand. So I, I thought this was kind of this, uh, the tossing of the torch in a way. Um, <laughs> all right, now the Good Friday experiment. Um, what people, um, what shocked me is that it took place in the Mars Chapel. And when you look at the inscription that's above the door to the chapel, now the actual Good Friday experiment, the group was down in a basement chapel, but Howard Thurman was above you know, giving the lecture and it was piped in downstairs. But what I was shocked to read, chiseled in there is, let this chapel at the center of the university campus signify forever the centrality both of intellectual and experimental religion in education and also of devotion to God's righteous rule in human lives. So this phrase, experimental religion, that they put up there way before they even had the Good Friday experiment. Now, the other part is that Howard Thurman, who is the minister here, studied with Gandhi. 
and he was very interested in the role of uh, spirituality in political action, the, the, the political implications of the mystical experience. And Howard Thurman was also the mentor for Martin Luther King. And Martin Luther King got his PhD at Boston University. So we have, from the person that really helped start this research in psychedelics and mystical experiences, also helped introduce the whole concept of nonviolent resistance to the American civil rights movement. It's really inspiring. So one of the problems, though, now I'll just say from the, my follow-up to the Good Friday experiment, was that the results were affirmed, you know, that, that it was shocking. People could remember very clearly what their psilocybin was. A lot of times the people that got the placebo didn't have that much memories, but what I found was that there was a bit of an exaggeration of the benefits. It was written in Time magazine. Everybody that had the, the psilocybin had a mystical experience like the saints of all the ages, and that's not true. Not all of them did. And then it turned out that one person was so moved by uh, Howard Thurman's speech, which, by the way, is, um, was recorded and is on the MAPS website. So if you want to hear Howard Thurman's Good Friday lecture, we still have it. And one party's like, you have to tell people there's a man on the cross. You have to tell people there's a man on the cross. And this one divinity student from Andover Newton said, yeah, I, I should do that. I, I should do that now. <laughs> and I should tell the president. And I should leave this room, and I should go tell the president. And then he's like, well, the president is in Washington. I'll tell the president of the university. So he's wandering down, as you know, Commonwealth Avenue is not very, uh, it's, a quiet, it's not a quiet street. <laughs> and so um, Walter Pankey and uh, Houston Smith got really nervous and went chasing after him. And they caught him, and he didn't want to go back indoors. Now he's outside, and he's got this mission to tell the president. So they injected him with Thorazine. And that was completely uh, missed. They never reported that. So there's a bit of an overemphasis on the benefits and a minimization of the risks. All right, but then their next step was going to be the Concord Prison Experiment. And this was this idea that you could have a mystical experience, but how you describe it is subjective. What you say about its benefits, in a way, are subjective. But if you can reduce recidivism, that's an objective, external measure. And this would be a great way to show that psychedelics had transformative power. And so they actually went into Concord Prison, took psilocybin with the prisoners. They would have half the researchers uh, stay, get a placebo, half to take psilocybin. And they uh, treated about 35 people, and they ended up uh, releasing them, and then they tracked recidivism. And this was considered to be one of the most uh, best examples of psychedelic therapy uh, in the history of the psychedelic literature. And when my paper uh, about the Good Friday Experiment was published in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology in 1991, I got a call from someone from the Department of Corrections here in Massachusetts, and he said they had a room with uh, the files from interesting prisoners. Uh, Malcolm X was one of them. And, but they had the prisoners from the Concord Prison Experiment, and that list was gone. Nobody had that list. So they let me go ahead and um, do that. It took a whole year to get permission from the governor, and the permission came with this scribbled, uh, it was permission, but somebody had scribbled, no psilocybin. <laughs> you know, we weren't asking to give psilocybin. It was like, no psilocybin, just to make sure. So what I discovered, unfortunately, was that this was... Um, a completely flawed analysis and that it did not really work. And that there was one example that you could say is uh, close to scientific fraud, which was that obviously the longer you're out of prison, the more likely you are to go back. So they compared their um, 35 plus people uh, when they were an average of 10 months out of prison and they compared it to the base rate of people that had been released from Concord prison the years before, but at 30 months. So it's obviously that there'll be more people going back to prison after 30 months. And when you look at the actual paper that they, just, that they wrote where their base rates, they, they tracked it over time. So the 10 month rates for each one of them were identical. But what happened was that Leary and Metzner and Roundhouse, they all realized that you cannot just give somebody a, a psychedelic experience, you have to support them when they get out of prison. The same way that we talk about integration after the psychedelic experience. And once they realized that, they started setting these up and then they got kicked out of Harvard. And so that fell apart. So the experiment has never really been done. But it's an example, I think, of Leary believing that since the world was demonizing psychedelics and exaggerating the risks and suppressing and denying the benefits, that he was justified to do the opposite. And so I think we have to be very careful. If there's going to be a backlash, I think it'll come from us exaggerating the risks, um, I mean, exaggerating the benefits and minimizing the risks. Um, now. Part of symbolism of the psychedelic renaissance is we had to start research at Harvard again. 
because this is where things began. We also had to start research with LSD because that's the quintessential scary psychedelic. So in 2007, we did manage to start at McLean Hospital a study with MDMA for cancer patients. And one of the ones, things that I'm most proud of in the entire um, history of uh, 37 years of MAPS is that we managed to start LSD research in Switzerland in 2008, right before Albert Hoffman died and his wife Anita. So they were married 70, 79 years, but they were able to see the very beginnings of LSD research starting again. But it was really also this symbolism of getting uh, psychedelic research starting back at Harvard that I think helped cement this concept of the psychedelic renaissance. Now, we have two successful phase three studies, and this is just the results of our first one, severe PTSD. Th there's a whole strategic analysis, I won't get into it because of time, but, but there's a whole strategic analysis, like which drug, which condition is most likely to make it through the system. I thought MDMA being the most gentle, uh, and we needed uh, sympathetic patients. So I like to say we don't do science, we do political science. We have to be very careful of, of why we're doing this and what's the message that we're sending. So this is severe PTSD, often in uh, veterans and others, although the veterans get the media attention, but two-thirds of the people with PTSD are women from sexual assault, usually. So the veterans get the media attention, and, and it's not quite a fair representation, but it's, it's a way to get bipartisan support. So what we showed is that therapy plus inactive placebo uh, which was the best um, way to do this double-blind study, which the FDA agreed. Um, One-third of the people, 32%, no longer had PTSD at the two-month follow-up after three day-long therapy sessions and 12 90-minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions. So 42 hours of therapy. So it's pretty great that these people who had PTSD an average of 14 years, one-third over 20 years, one-third of them almost had no P no, they would not qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD at the two-month follow-up. But then you give uh, MDMA, you add it to the mix, and it more than doubles to 67%. So it's astounding. And another 21% are uh, treatment responders. They, they have clinically significant reductions of PTSD, but they still have PTSD. If we give them a four session or over time, so we basically have 88% responders, 12% non-responders. So this was our first phase three study. Um, our second one, we just released a press release January 5th that was... Um, Confirmatory. So you talk about your first is a pivotal study, your second is confirmatory. So it has taken us um, from 1986 when I started MAPS, 85 was when MDMA was criminalized. So pretty much 37 years to, to get to this point of two successful phase three studies. And this was um, very, very successful and is being uh, submitted to a major journal and hopefully it'll be published in the next couple months. Um, and then uh, we've got the world's biggest uh, conference on psychedelics coming up in Denver. I'd like to invite all of you to that. We've already got over 5,000 people coming. Um, we've had three other psychedelic science conferences, uh, 2010, 2013, 2017. And this is the one, the theme is sort of um, the doorway to the new world. You know, and this new world is going to be uh, not just uh, uh, MDMA, but psilocybin and other substances becoming, I believe, prescription medicines in certain kind of controlled contexts. And so I'm very proud that Josh Gordon, who's the head of NIMH, is gonna be coming, Michael Pollan's coming, uh, Deepak Chopra. Um, there was actually a really hilarious thing, I'll say it was on um, Fox, Sport, Fox News Sports, and it was about uh, Aaron Rodgers, who's a football quarterback, and I, I was just with him the other day in Austin, and uh, he's had ayahuasca experiences. And so this was like Fox News, like a sports team debating, is this a good idea, is this a bad idea, <laughs> what, is, what is this? But to see the Fox people come on, oh no, it's just for medicine, it's not, a, it, was, it was fantastic. So I would like to invite you all to this conference and it's just a pleasure to see that the Divinity School is really comfortable and, and law school that all of this is moving forward in an above ground way. And I will say, I think it is becoming the culture, not the counterculture. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rick. A wonderful example of the past of Harvard meeting the present and hopefully helping create the future. We are now going to turn, our next two pre presenters will be on um, Zoom. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Mason Marks. Let's see if uh, he's able to just un. 
There we go. Yep. So Dr. Mason Marks is the Florida Bar Health Law Section Professor at the Florida State University College of Law. At Harvard Law School, he is a senior fellow and project lead of the Project on Psychedelics Law and Regulation, Poplar, at the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics. I welcome to the virtual stage, Mason Marks. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Paul and uh, Professor Stang for organizing this event. It's really great to be with you. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the work that we're doing at the Project on Psychedelics Law and Regulation. Um, Glenn Cohen talked about a couple of the projects we've been working on, and I'll talk about two more. We started Poplar in 2021 because we were watching these academic programs crop up around the country and around the world, but they were all focused on the medical applications for psychedelics. And we observed that there was a lack of work being done on legal and ethics side. And so that is really the, the necessity through which Poplar was born. And I really wanna thank um, uh, Tim Ferriss and Matt Mullenweg for supporting our research through, this, through the SciSay Foundation. Uh, we just really see the law as one of the primary obstacles to scientific progress in this area. So I'm really excited to be a part of um, exploring the legal landscape. And that's what I want to talk about first is to provide you with an overview of the psychedelic legal reforms that are sweeping across the country, what I like to refer to as the psychedelic legal renaissance. And most of the action is on the local and state level. Uh, I'll give you an overview of that, and I'll talk a little bit about what's going on at the federal level, but it's not quite as comprehensive. So I recently published an article called The Varieties of Psychedelic Law in the journal Neuropharmacology, where I break down five different categories of psychedelic legislation that we're seeing. There are others that exist in other countries, but these five are really the types that we're seeing in the US and certain hybrid approaches, combinations of these different categories. And the first is decriminalization, which involves either the uh, uh, reduction or elimination of criminal penalties associated with various activities like producing, possessing, consuming, or sharing psychedelics. And decriminalization really exists along a spectrum. So on one end of the spectrum, you might see complete elimination of criminal penalties. And on the other, you might see criminal penalties remaining in place, but a legislature or a city council issuing a policy that it won't enforce those penalties. And so that might more accurately be described as deprioritization rather than, than full decriminalization. This trend really started in the US in 2019 when Denver became the first US city to decriminalize psilocybin producing mushrooms. And several other cities like Oakland, California, Santa Cruz, California, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Cambridge and Somerville, Massachusetts followed suit shortly thereafter, and they added other substances in addition to psilocybin. Massachusetts really has become a leader in this area. There are about 15 cities now that have decriminalized psychedelics to some extent. I believe Massachusetts has five, and that is thanks to the efforts of activists like those at a group called Bay Staters for Natural Medicine mm -hmm. and other groups like them around the country, like Spore in Colorado and Decrim Nature Seattle in Washington state. These groups have, are, are volunteering their time to educate lawmakers about psychedelics and to advise them on decriminalization policies. At the state level, we only have two states that have decriminalized psychedelics to varying extents, Oregon and Colorado. Oregon was the first state where voters passed a ballot initiative, Measure 110, in November of 2020, which partially decriminalized psychedelics or the possession of small amounts, personal use amounts, not only of psychedelics, but of other controlled substances like cocaine and heroin, for example. And it reduced the penalty from a misdemeanor to a civil infraction or a $100 fine that people can avoid by agreeing to go through a, a substance use treatment assessment process. Uh, the second state to implement decriminalization was Colorado, where voters passed Proposition 122 or the Natural Medicine Health Act last November. And this is another ballot initiative. So far, decriminalization has not been very palatable to state legislatures, and we've only seen 
these types of laws uh, come into being through ballot initiatives or voters approve them. In Colorado, the decriminalization went a little bit farther. Instead of limiting uh, the, the uh, limiting penalties to people who possess more than personal amounts, in Colorado, Proposition 122 removed criminal penalties for production and even sharing of psychedelics, and not just psilocybin, but um, psilocin, mescaline, ibogaine, and dimethyltryptamine. The next category that I wanna talk about is called supported adult use. And I like to draw a comparison to recreational cannabis or what might more accurately be called adult use cannabis regulation. This is really the dispensary model that exists in many US states, including Massachusetts, where people go to a retail store and they purchase cannabis and they can do so for any reason. They don't need a medical diagnosis. They don't need a doctor's prescription. The supported adult use of psychedelics like psilocybin is similar in many ways because people don't need a medical diagnosis or prescription. However, they can't take the product home. They have to utilize it at a special center, a service center or healing center where a licensed psychedelic facilitator is there to support them, ensure their comfort and safety. So Oregon was the first state, again, to implement this type of legislation. Voters approved Measure 109, the Oregon Psilocybin Services Act, alongside the decriminalization uh, ballot initiative, Measure 110, again, in November of 2020. And since then, there's been a two-year rulemaking process where the Oregon Health Authority has been creating rules for this emerging industry that it published in December. Colorado is a little bit later, uh, came along a little bit later. Uh, alongside the decriminalization provision of the Natural Medicine Health Act, there was also a framework for supported adult use passed last November. And the governor recently appointed members to a Colorado Natural Medicine Advisory Board in January. And that board will start meeting this month on the 13th to, to start advising regulators in Colorado on these rules, which will take shape over the next 12 to 18 months. And um, uh, these service centers should open later this year in Oregon, but they are still several years in the future for Colorado. Now, there are some other states that have this type of legislation under consideration currently. Illinois, for example, has a similar type of hybrid bill that combines decriminalization with a supported adult use framework. So we'll see what happens with that bill and similar bills in other states. The third category is medical use. This is really the closest to traditional healthcare where someone needs a particular medical diagnosis. They need a physician's recommendation or prescription. And we're seeing bills like this in various states like New York. There is a proposal, Connecticut actually enacted this type of legislation. Unlike supported adult use, which arguably conflicts with federal laws like the Controlled Substances Act, medical use legislation also often dovetails fairly nicely with federal laws and FDA regulations. So in, in Connecticut, for example, they are, are leveraging uh, the FDA's existing expanded use program. And that allows one to provide access to a controlled substance, an experimental or an investigational drug that is not yet FDA approved. The fourth category of legislation we're seeing is best characterized as clinical research. And this is really just where a state provides some funding and support to open a clinical trial in the state. Texas is perhaps the best example of this where uh, research is getting underway in Houston at the Houston uh, Medical Center and VA uh, utilizing, I believe it's psilocybin in a uh, veteran population with PTSD. And the final category that I'll touch on, I call policy analysis. This is probably the most conservative approach to psychedelic legal reform. Really what happens is the legislature might provide some money to create a task force or a work group to study the feasibility of further psychedelic legislation. And we've seen this type of legislation uh, under consideration in states like Hawaii, as well as Washington state, which now has this type of bill under consideration by the legislature. One of the projects that we have uh, in the works, which should come out any day now actually in the Boston University Law Review, 
is a law review article about the regulation of microdosing, where people take small doses of a psychedelic, typically a dose that doesn't cause any perceptual changes. And in this article, we address how microdosing is regulated currently under state, local, and federal law and how that um, perhaps should change in the future. The second thing I wanna talk about in my remaining couple minutes is the reform of, of controlled substance regulation. Our colleague at Poplar, Carmel Shahar, and I recently uh, published an article in Nature Medicine called Drug Scheduling Limits Access to Essential Medicine, Medicines and Should Be Reformed. And in this piece, we talk about how uh, we like to think of Schedule I, uh, which is the most heavily restricted category of controlled substance, as a regulatory black hole. And that's because once substances are placed into Schedule One, they almost never come out. And that's due to an informational asymmetry where very little, often low quality evidence is required to put a substance into Schedule One, but you need a mountain of uh, very high quality evidence to take it out. And due to this informational asymmetry, substances get trapped there. And I know that Rick Doblin is very familiar with this because in the 1980s, he urged the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, not to put MDMA into Schedule One, and they went ahead and, and did that anyway. And it's taken all these years since then and tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to be on the brink of potentially taking MDMA out of Schedule One. And part of the problem is that over the years, many people, including uh, courts and legislators and regulators, have confused the requirements and the purpose of scheduling with the FDA approval process. And oftentimes they're treated as the same when they actually serve different purposes and have different requirements. There are some efforts to try to change that. The one I'll just mention briefly is the Breakthrough Therapies Act under consideration uh, by Congress, which is being sponsored by Senators Booker and Paul. And what that would do is that would help address this information asymmetry. Right now you really need data from phase two or more likely phase three clinical trials, if not full FDA approval to take a substance out of schedule one. And the Breakthrough Therapies Act would reschedule substances that are designated breakthrough therapies by the FDA. Psilocybin and MDMA have both been designated breakthrough therapies, which means that they could represent a significant improvement over existing treatments. And to get that designation, you only need safety data from phase one clinical trial. So that would significantly reduce that barrier and could help take substances that could arguably be life-saving for many people out of schedule one, get them into researchers' hands and get them into the hands of clinicians and patients sooner. So there isn't a lot happening right now at the federal level. There's some early activity like the Breakthrough Therapies Act. Congress now has a, um, uh, a psychedelic caucus to educate members of Congress about psychedelics and a, and a psychedelic task force is also forming. I'm, I'm encouraged by that. I think there will be a lot of exciting developments in the future. And I just wanna wrap up by saying that I think Harvard really is the leader in this area. I don't think any other university has the depth and breadth of programs on psychedelics that, that span the law, uh, religious use and um, uh, medical use and others quite so effectively. So I think the future is very bright for psychedelics research at Harvard, and I hope you all will participate in that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mason. Our final speaker today, our final panelist today is William Leonard Picard. Um, William Picard is alleged to, or Leonard Picard is alleged to have produced 90% of the world's LSD. I believe that is a quote from the DEA. <laughs> <clears throat> he is a former drug policy fellow at Harvard Ken Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, research asso associate in neurobiology at Harvard Medical School, and deputy director of the Drug Policy Analysis Program at the University of California, Los Angeles. With two life sentences without parole, he served 20 years in maximum security federal prisons before being released in 2020. I am very honored to welcome Leonard Picard to the virtual stage. Yes, good afternoon and uh, lovely to be with you all and especially with uh, colleagues, uh, Blinko and Mason Marks and uh, Rick Doblin. 
Lovely to see you all. I must appear uh, virtually, uh, not being permitted to travel on this occasion, but uh, uh, we'll do a brief uh, historical aspect of what all came before the medicalization uh, paradigm and the, some projections on possible futures, the what may come. And so let's say, share our screen and proceed into uh, a number of slides on the historical aspects, and then we'll return to possible future scenarios. Imagine yourself 20 years ago. What were you doing in psychedelics? I was kneeling in this field in Kansas with a gun placed to my head, explaining my brains were going to be blown out for making 90% uh, of the world's LSD. Of course, I uh, disagreed with this uh, idea, but I had arrived in the field after running through the night uh, with police helicopters overhead with down-looking uh, infrared, and uh, finally into a, uh, a little barn, in which case um, uh, I prayed through the night and in the morning was surrounded and kneeling on the field. 90% of the world's LSD, that's hundreds of millions of doses uh, during uh, the past 20 years, allegedly. But what were the historical events that brought me to my knees in that field in Kansas? It all started with this fellow, Augustus Stanley Owsley uh, of a Kentucky uh, political family. Um, Owsley uh, produced during his lifetime uh, 500 grams of LSD in the early 60s. That's uh, a, million, a million doses. Quite a large batch at the time went out all over San Francisco and Northern California. Um, but he was superseded by this fellow, Nicky Sand. Nikki Sand, the chief chemist of the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, and a, a friend of Rick's before, before he passed, as well as my own in my youth. Uh, Nikki, uh, a wonderful blotter photograph of Nikki, produced um, 150 million doses in the course of his career, about 13 kilograms of uh, pure LSD that went out across not only Northern California, but across America and the world, and Italy, France, uh, Thailand, South America, a, a revolution at the time. The Kansas lab was um, alleged by the government to produce that quantity each year for 20 years. Uh, Nikki, uh, Owsley, and myself were all students of this wonderful individual, Sasha Shulgin and Ann Shulgin, um, authors of the seminal text, Pical and Tikal, uh, Sasha was the lone voice crying in the wilderness in the 80s and 70s, um, the leading medicinal chemist pharmacologist in the world in terms of entheogens, an inventor of hundreds of analogs of uh, great consequence, um, the early promoter of MDMA for underground therapy and the inventor of 2CB and DIPT and a wonderful uh, constellation of very interesting compounds. Sasha and Ann in a blotter holding a molecule in MDMA, a beloved throughout the world for their contributions. Uh, but before all of this occurred, I found myself at Kennedy School, <laughs> just down the street from the Div School, uh, up all night having uh, uh, extraordinary uh, experiences uh, learning in uh, drug policy, um, alleged by the government to have uh, issued uh, during this period, uh, on occasion, uh, interesting blotters. This is a um, <clears throat> album cover blotters. It's uh, the Grateful Dead album covers. 50 doses, you can see the little lines that break each dose apart, each containing about 100 micrograms of LSD. But mostly at the Kennedy School, studying under this wonderful, <clears throat> wonderful teacher, the leading drug policy analyst uh, in the United States, and also uh, Rick's mentor, uh, as well as mine, an early influence on the structure of, um, of MAPS, and uh, his progress through uh, DEA and FDA regulations. Uh, but back to the field in Kansas, which led me here. Ah, 30 foot walls, no horizons, no flowers, no children, no dogs, no streams, no Mozart, uh, just uh, gravel, walls, steel, a rather uh, horrific uh, environment. Uh, especially with these grad students in criminology, <laughs> 
Um, <clears throat> quite interesting uh, fellows that uh, one learned to be very polite around. Uh, there were killings, stabbings. I'm speaking here of um, extreme regulation. Remember, psychedelics are still Schedule One. They are uh, truly illegal, and possession of large quantities can lead you to this. This was my home for 20 years, uh, most of the time, uh, 60 square feet, uh, good for meditation and yoga uh, and writing. Um, during this period, I uh, reflected back on some early work at uh, the Kennedy School and the prediction of the fentanyl epidemic in 1996 under Mark Kleiman in which we anticipated the next major drug of abuse would be a fentanyl. Uh, that work was picked up by Rand Corporation in 2019 while I was still incarcerated and published in their seminal work, The Future of Fentanyl and Other Synthetic Opioids. Uh, I was released uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, Rand quoted the fentanyl prediction at the Kennedy School uh, as the first prediction uh, and recommendations for prevention of a epidemic that was 20 years in the future uh, was considered science fiction in 96, but unfortunately became the tragedy it is today. Uh, released in 2020, I entered a world where billions of dollars and thousands of distinguished uh, researchers had eyes upon psychedelics. And I encountered now working with a venture firm in New York City, um, uh, great organizations such as uh, Cybin, uh, Compass, uh, which is run afoul <clears throat> of uh, American view in terms of its uh, control of the patents for psilocybin, but still uh, extraordinary uh, collection of individuals. Uh, Gilgamesh, which is a Ibogaine analog firm, much of the new structures made by Dolly Sames Lab, a chair of chemistry at Columbia, um, manufactured overseas, uh, now valued at about $80 million. Uh, and other other firms, uh, hundreds of firms, frankly, three, three to 500 psychedelic firms have appeared in the last three years as a result of uh, not only Rick's work, but um, Roland's work, uh, seminal efforts at Hopkins. Of course, DARPA got into the, the mix and is now offering, uh, oh goodness, uh, 20 or $30 million of grants uh, to develop um, substances that are not psychoactive, that have effects on neuroplasticity, they may have healing effects, but the long night of the soul is not necessarily required uh, to uh, have these effects. So the hypothesis goes, the community is still divided upon it. Uh, the most interesting developments that I can see presently are in artificial intelligence. <clears throat> In the firm that I work for, we see a number of startups, Celera, um, um, Cybio, um, Gilgamesh, um, a number of firms that rely upon artificial intelligence and computational chemistry in order to um, create uh, novel compounds. And so this leads us into what is the question of the future? What uh, outcomes will we see? in the next uh, five to 10 years, or ultimately, which way are we going? Let me get off screen sharing now so that I can, so we might get a good look at each other. Uh, the future, uh, based on uh, the, what we see in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of drug development, uh, the wide variety of MDMA analogs and DMT analogs by firms such as Tactogen and Redwood City, and uh, Beckley, uh, SciTech, and at Oxford, uh, we see we will see tens of thousands of new analogs based on the classical legacy compounds, DMT, mescaline, LSD, psilocybin. We'll see intravenous use, sublingual use, uh, buccal use, um, every conceivable variety of um, variations on these molecules is being developed as we speak. Stakeholders are are uh, claiming uh, claiming patent rights for every every molecular variation, even those dreamed purely in silico by artificial intelligence platforms such as Schrodinger. So we have four possible futures uh, I could anticipate uh, based on experience that we may be moving toward. Uh, the first future was all is well, things will go smoothly, 
the 300 clinical trials will play out quite easily. Uh, we'll have wonderful new medicines, all well and good. I trust that will be what will occur. Um, the second possibility is we'll have an untoward event. Something unusual may happen on the street or something unusual may happen in the clinic. There may be a behavioral acting out. <clears throat> this sort of thing was seized upon by the government in the 60s to create the, uh, the great darkness of the next 30 years and the oppression and laws and heavy regulations that occurred as a result of it. So the second alternative in the future is we see an unusual event occur clinically or on the street, something worthy of media, in which case there may be a, a blowback uh, media-wise. Right now we're in a honeymoon phase, very positive things. We all have great hope for uh, BRICS effort, those of MAPS, those of the hundreds of firms doing such wonderful research. And we have the momentum and the distinguished eyes upon this and the funding upon it. So the future is likely bright, but there may be. Uh, an awkward uh, moment in the next few years. Uh, the third possible uh, future is an increase in regulation during such awkward moment, uh, increase in uh, moving backwards in time, perhaps uh, 10 years. We, I don't consider that very likely. I consider that regulations will continue to soften uh, barring an awkward event, um, such as um, uh, more tolerance of the decriminalization movement, more federalization on the Hill, uh, the Booker Rand Paul um, Breakthrough Act, allowing uh, um, the rescheduling to schedule two uh, more research in that. Um, but all of these fut futures, the fourth future, is complicated by the variety of analogs that are occurring. We'll see analogs that are marvelously new medicines. We'll see analogs that are little horrors, new beasts like fentanyl. So the future is caught between these two extremes. Uh, likely the uh, positive aspects will prevail, but th there may be um, little horrors that come along. Um, for example, is NBOM, the hallucinatory variant on 2CB that turned out to be something of a killer in India and parts of Europe. We'll see development of new religious cults, like under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So those in the Div School that want a, a good PhD thesis might consider RIFRA evolving from legacy compounds and also from new analogs, a new God molecule that attracts attention from congregations. Um, in closing, I can only point out that in the past, medicalization has led to uh, maybe 20 or 30,000 individuals receiving psychedelics. That's about to change. There'll be hundreds of thousands, if not millions. But in the past, in the underground, there were 2 billion doses distributed around the world in the last 40 years, and that continues at the rate of two to 300 million doses a year in the illicit underground market. We trust that the medical market will um, expand broadly around the world, bringing marvelous new medicines. Let me close uh, with those thoughts and uh, with all honor to our distinguished panelists and all honor to the many gathered here today to advance this, this dream. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard, and thank you all of our panelists. Sponsors, the Harvard Psychedelics Project at HDS, the Center for the Study of World Religions at HDS, and Harvard Divinity School. Copyright 2023, President and Fellows of Harvard College.